Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, muy buenas noches. Esto es Luis Alberto Jovel trayéndole en este día una entrevista, eh, una entrevista muy especial con John Barclay. Como ustedes pueden ver aquí eh, en la pantalla, John Barclay es el Life Profesor de Divinidad en Durham University en el Reino Unido. Y es, la, es lo que se considera como la, el asiento, la cátedra mejor dicho, la cátedra más codiciada en el mundo de teología o de estudios bíblicos. Así que eh, en este día eh, yo le invito a que ponga eh, aquí en YouTube o donde usted lo esté viendo, que ponga para que pueda traducir al español para que usted pueda ver eh, esto y, 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 y ustedes puedan es, eh, disfrutar lo que nos va a decir de que es de este libro, este libro que lo, 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 eh, la teología de la gracia por John Barclay, este es el libro que se ha considerado que está cambiando todos los paradigmas en los últimos 50 años eh, y, que, y que va a ser eh, que está poniendo unos paradigmas y viendo las cosas de una nueva de una nueva forma así que yo le invito a que nos a, a que se quede aquí welcome professor Barclay uh, it's been a, it's been actually uh, this interview is been years in the making because uh, I remember the first time I suggested your book to be translated it, and um, and it has taken some time because uh, as, as, as we were talking before, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very big book. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I'm really grateful to the to the translator for, for doing all that work. Yes. Thank okay, you. So, uh, so, it's hope. So hopefully Saul that looks at this and, and he's going to feel good. Yeah. So can you tell us something about, about yourself? Can you introduce yourself to us, please? Yes. Um, so I'm, a, uh, as, as you've just said, I'm a professor in, in, in New Testament and early Christianity in the University of, of Durham. Um, I've worked in Glasgow University and I've worked here in, in Durham University. Um, I, I grew up in a in a Christian uh, family, um, and I've I studied first of all I studied classics, so Greek and Latin, so the ancient world, and then I switched to study uh, theology. Uh, did my degree, my PhD at Cambridge University, um, but then, as I say, worked in in Glasgow in Scotland, and then uh, here in in Durham. So uh, I'm a um, I, uh, I'm, I'm married and I uh, have uh, three three grown up children and and three grandchildren. Uh, but um, this this uh, this work uh, this this book I've done has been a, a big part of my life in the last few years. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's, it's you. You got a lot of interviews um, yes. from this book. <laughs> I think this is a. I I know that maybe you don't want to be known just for one book alone, but would this be the book that you have had most uh, follow up? Yes, I, I I did my 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 PhD initially was on Paul, uh, and but then after that I I spent a lot of time studying ancient Judaism. I, I did some work on on diaspora Judaism, published a book on that, and I then published a book on on Josephus, the Jewish historian, mm -hmm. and his apologetic work. Um, so I'm I'm you know I, I was pleased with that period of work, but then when I came back to Paul, I felt like I've got something. I need to say about this that hasn't been said yet and um so i did put quite a lot of work into into this book i um i've been a bit surprised to be honest at, at how widely it's it's been received both by uh biblical scholars and and by theologians so i've, I've been delighted it's been it's, it's been picked up and i'm just uh thrilled to see it translated now into spanish yes uh, um it's uh you know, E.P. Sanders' book, that uh, your book has been called, that it has changed uh, the, the, the pattern of studying the New Testament. Right. Right. And E.P. Sanders did that 50 years ago. Right, right. But E.P. Right. Sanders hasn't been translated yet. So, uh, oh, right. yeah, right. I, I, I've, been, I've been banging on doors, John. I've been banging on doors. <laughs> uh, with your book, it was easy. I, I just have to tap. <laughs> but, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> but that E.P. Sanders died, uh, I think, earlier this year. Uh, yes, oh, I think he did. yes, yes, yes. Um, Earlier this year, late last year, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, so in the Spanish-speaking world, when the new perspective came around, uh, mm. people were like, "Because let, let me tell you, I'm one of those. I'm the guilty one. Apart from uh, from the because the, the the book from Wright, what some Paul really said, oh, yeah. was translated into Spanish. 
Ah. But before that, I started translating stuff from right. Oh, did <laughs> I, you? I, I met him when he has come here. And uh, and, wow. and right away um, in the Spanish speaking world, because they were never pro uh, projected into AP Sanders work on Judaism. Uh, I was called and, and Enteral was called heretic. This is heresy. Okay, this, is, right. okay. th this is not what the reformers taught us about Judaism. Okay. Right, but uh, right. but I always go yeah. back. But the reformers didn't have the this is cross. <laughs> the right, right. Have it's true. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think um, I think it's been important for scholarship and for the church to move on from a phase. You know, many centuries we sort of constructed Judaism in a very negative way as a religion of works and not a religion of grace and you know as a religion of works righteousness and that was the, obviously the, the 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 legacy of of the reformation and i think what ep sanders and the new perspective did was to insist i think rightly that we should not caricature um uh, uh, judaism in negative ways and mm -hmm. so what i was trying to do here was to say well let's look at the open this question again and to see actually whether there are different configurations different understandings of grace that it's not as simple as saying it's all about grace. Uh, you have to say, mm. well, what are the different understandings of grace? And so, you know, as I as I've said in this book, grace is everywhere in Second Temple yes. Judaism, but not everywhere the same. Mm. And that that's, that helps to break up the kind of monolithic way in which E. P. Sanders described the pattern mm. of, of ancient Judaism, and helps us to be more precise, I think, but more more nuanced in the way we discuss this. So what are you saying, John? Is that we as Protestants, yeah. we can move on from the reformers? Yeah. Well, I'm saying uh, I'm saying <laughs> that there's uh, there's that the, the, the uh, Reformation uh, reading of Paul was was in many respects brilliant and very appropriate to its time. Um, we have a lot to learn from it still, but we also have to move on in terms of we have we have new historical understanding of the ancient world. And we have new a new task, as it were, now, and to make Paul understandable and to make the gospel understandable in the in the present um, era. So, I do think we have to move on from some of the negative ways that the Christians have 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 talked about Judaism. Yes, we have to we have to move beyond Luther and Calvin in in mm -hmm. that respect. Before, um, but then, yeah. That's before I get into the questions, um, I just like to. Um, ask you the question that I that I, that I asked you that I was going to mm. say be before we started that the, how can you be a philologist an expert mm. in ancient writings um, and, and yet be a believer because in Latin America uh, th th there's this movement that either you if you are a person like like you you shouldn't be a believer you 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 should uh, Christianity is just history that we should look at it, and, and, and there has been such a shift to even insinuating that the real people who know Christianity are people like Q, who have a PhD, who work in the classics, but not the Christian, the the, the person who's who's showing up every Sunday, helping right. his community, doing what the book says <laughs> that you should do. Right. So, right. so how can you still be a believer right. and still be considered, even among your peers, even among non-Christian peers, mm. one of the best persons to to that, that knows the ancient world? Right. Well, I don't think it's it's an either or, and I think that sort of either or, either you're a good historian or you're a believer. I think that's a false dichotomy. Uh, I can see why. You know, in the culture wars in the mm. United States, for instance, is this might this might um, uh, this this either or might might grow up, but um, I don't think it's either necessary or or helpful because um, Christian faith certainly uh, you know requires taking all the historical evidence carefully and seriously, and um, we want to be the best you know historians uh, we can be. But I don't find the history. Um, it 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 may it may challenge certain parts of the traditional Christian belief, but it doesn't challenge to me the core elements of my of my, of my faith. 
And actually for me, what, you know, the, the questions this book is asking and really the questions I am asking are about, as it were, the meaning of the whole, the meaning of, 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 of the world and the meaning of God's, of God's, uh, um, action as creator and as and and as giver and as the one who uh, revealed himself in Jesus Christ and I don't find um, that incompatible at all to um, to um, uh, believe in God uh, I don't find that incompatible with my historical um, knowledge uh, as I say maybe some parts of my um, some parts of my initial evangelical upbringing i've had to rethink a bit as i've gone through my scholarly work so it's not been an entirely kind of straightforward um uh and because i think my faith has sometimes been quite fragile you know early on in my when i was young my faith was quite fragile and even a small kind of historical question would really would really upset me um but now i think i've got a larger perspective, as it were, as to what really counts, what really matters for the sake of, of the gospel, what, what the larger picture is about. And so um, some, on some historical questions that people fixate on, I'm, you know, did Paul write the pastoral letters or whatever, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm prepared to be quite flexible on, the, on, on that, uh, because it seems to me what matters is... Um, is the good news really as the reformers would say it's about has god acted in jesus christ to save and to and to re reconfigure the world and I, and I, and and that seems to me um still something um that's uh that i believe and that i um uh it's it's part of my identity as a historian and as a scholar mm. yes uh i think comes down also to the methodologies we choose to 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 um to ally to to make them our allies. Uh. Yes, that, that's right. I mean, I think sometimes people say, "Oh, well, you've got to use critical theory, as it were." To and I'm saying, well, there's different kinds of critical theory, and some some critical theories that people use um, to do their historical work, for instance, are 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 designed to be anti, mm. uh, you know, are designed to be anti theological, are designed to be. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, critical of of religion and of on, and of theology, and I think it's important to say, well, why should we adopt those his critical perspectives? They are, you know, they 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 they're the product of of a post enlightenment uh, uh, um, period of Western history, and we have the right to question um, uh, that period of history and to right to, the right to question whether. Those are the necessary tools. I think theology is also a critical theory, and therefore, mm. you know, I, when yes. I bring my historical work and my textual work in conversation with theology, I'm using another kind of critical theory, mm. um, but but one that I think is perfectly justifiable. And they have, and they both have a uh, the same uh, right to be in the uh, in the market of the of ideas. Yes, yes. Uh, that's right. I think I think we've almost, uh, you know, we've one of the points of about where we are in sort of in the history of of Western culture is the postmodern turn. Realize, you know, is the recognition that a lot of the things that we've taken to be rational or mm. critical or uh, you know the only proper scholarly tools are themselves the product of certain moments of Western history, even Western colonialism and Western uh, um, um, Western culture. And um, we don't have to be bound by them. It's a choice whether we, mm. you know, whether, whether we take those uh, um, as our guiding uh, ideologies. Yes. Um, and it seems to me that, that the Christian tradition has its own uh, intellectual resources, um, which are you know have to be brought into conversation with what we find from history and science and so on uh but uh they are they are perfectly respectable and indeed very fruitful um intellectual resources for doing whatever we do including historical work on the bible thank you thank you thank you john for because coming from me nobody listens to but coming from you i, I ho hope that people will take more notice right well uh my first question is can you provide an overview of your book, uh, an overview of your very thick book, uh, sure. Paul and the Gift, and sure. explain 
the main thesis or argument you put forward? Sure. So the first thing I do in this book is to is to put Paul's language of 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 grace into the larger domain, the larger field of of gift, because the, the language Paul uses and he uses a mixture of different terms is all part of a single field of how people talked about gifts in the ancient world. And one of the things I do immediately in this book is to say, yeah, but we need to be careful because our assumptions about gifts and how they work, for instance, our assumption that the best gift is a gift given with no strings attached, with no expectation of return. That's our assumption, but it may not be Paul's assumption. So I do some work with the anthropology of gift to look at how gifts work in different cultures uh, and ask first questions like when Paul uses gift language, what does he mean by it? And then the next step in the book is to say, well, when people talk about the pure gift or the absolute gift or the, the uh, free gift, they're often drawing out a concept to a, an extreme point that they're, 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 they're clarifying or purifying a notion. And I'm, But my argument is that there's several different ways of, of doing this so that some of the battles during Christian history about what we mean by grace are not because some people believe in grace more than others and others believe less, but that they're understanding this concept in different ways, what I call different, there are different perfections of yes, grace. Different you, uh, I... I put them down here, but I'm going to have to translate uh, six dimensions for the perfect gift, you said. Yes, right, right. Uh, yes. The super, avant uh, super abundance, singularity, yeah. priority, incongruity, efficacy, yeah. and non-circularity. That's right, that's right. So, the chapter two. Uh, <laughs> I'm jumping. They, uh, I haven't time to spell all, all those out now, but my point is they're not a package deal. You don't have to take, if you take one, you don't have to take them mm -hmm. all. And sometimes what's happened, for instance, and Augustine perfected certain features of, of, of grace and his opponents uh, perfected other features of, of grace and so on. So I try to understand Augustine and the, and, 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 and the reformers, for instance, and, and modern scholars in, in terms of how they've unpacked, as it were, this concept of grace because it's a more nuanced and a more multifaceted concept than we might think yes uh there's been a even study on on, on augustine and pelagius that uh, the yes. uh, even um i think they had uh, 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 augustine misrepresented pelagius i think uh, yes well yeah. i think pelagius is a more complicated figure than than the negative you know image that mm. we sometimes have for him uh, and augustine himself became um, you know, quite extreme in, in the end of his life in sort of pulling on certain on certain threads, as it were, in the in the tapestry of grace. Mm -hmm. um, but I've tried to understand, uh, not so much to judge, but to want just to understand what's happening when people insist that grace must mean this or must mean that. And one of the things that's helped me do, and the next stage in 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 the book is to say, well, how do how was grace understood in Second Temple Judaism, and to move beyond the kind of either or, well, either religion, mm. Judaism is a religion of grace or it's not a religion of grace, it's a religion of works, to move beyond those polarities and to say, oh, well, we've now got a more uh, a more accurate and a more refined tool for understanding how um, grace works in, uh, in Second Temple uh, Judaism. And that's where I, I, I said I thought Ed Sanders' work, valuable as it was, um, uh, didn't capture the whole range of different uh, perspectives within within Second Temple um, Judaism. He was f focusing on sequence, on what I call the priority of grace, that grace mm. comes first before, before uh, um, obeying the law. But I'm saying, but one of the interesting differences is that some texts, some Jewish texts, are very insistent that God's grace is given to those who are worthy of it, to those who are fitting with it. Whereas other Jewish texts uh, uh, um, perfect the notion of grace or draw out this dimension of grace as a gift given to the unworthy, the, in, the incongruous gift. And my argument is that Paul understands the gift of God in Christ, which is for him the central moment of grace, the central uh, paradigm of grace and the fulfillment of God's grace to the world, that Paul understands that as a gift given without regard to worth, without regard 
to the fittingness of the recipient. So in my this last parts of the book are a study of Romans and a study, a mm -hmm. study sorry, of uh, part three is a study of Galatians and then a study of Romans. So I've really focused just on those two um, letters in this book. I'm, in your index, uh, in your index, Romans is a long <laughs> Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's it's a well, it's a big letter and it's an, an important letter. And mm -hmm. I I wanted to really see if I could read Romans in a way that really drew out the uh, the incongruity, what I call the incongruity of grace. That's say grace given uh, without prior condition and without regard to the worth of the recipient. And I use the word worth rather than the word works. Because worth is a larger category. It includes ethnic worth, social worth, gender worth, cultural worth. Uh, and, and my argument is, and here I'm building on the new perspective, but deepening it, I think, theologically. My argument is that Paul's mission to the Gentiles uh, is founded on the sense that God's gift is given without regard to their ethnic worth or their social or their moral or their cultural worth. And that grace, which the Protestant tradition has tried, tended to interpret in very individual terms, grace to me, a sinner, um, it is individual. You know, Paul can mm. individualize it, definitely. Um, Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. But it's also the foundation for his mission to Gentiles because he recognizes that um, the uh, Jewish cultural tradition um, is not, as it were, the package into which all Gentiles have to be have to be uh, placed. That's his big argument in Galatians, because it is a gift given, as he and Peter have come to recognize, a gift given without regard to their mm. Jewish ancestry, without regard to their Jewish uh, practices and ways and ways of life, and therefore it's a gift given uh, to Gentiles on the same on the same terms. So I've tried to draw out how grace is not just as I say, about an individual salvation, it's also the foundation of communities, new communities that cross ethnic and social boundaries. Uh, yes, you remind me of, of, of chapter 10 of Book of Acts, how the, the people from Jerusalem were so yeah. struck seeing that the gift of the yes. Holy Spirit was given even to Gentiles. Yes. And, and, that's right. And listening to you and reading your, your book, uh, that, that's what came to my mind. I said, yes, this is not only justification of sinners, but also justification of of ethnos of of other uh, races. Of, of yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. I think I think and and it's also you know one could go elsewhere and look at the principle. It's you know what he says in in one Corinthians one. It's about even those without wisdom, without education, mm. without power, and so on. And remember your calling, which is a way of talking about social grace. worth. Social work. Yes, too. exactly, exactly. So, I've tried to get away from the old patterns, Reformation patterns of grace versus works, and said, well, yes, it is about you know we we don't we're not saved on the basis of what we've achieved, but it's not just what we've achieved; it's also our, our inheritance, our ancestry, our ethnicity, and so on. All of those things are not conditions. Or 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 or, or uh, frames in which in which God's um, grace operates. So it has this radical freedom, mm. as you say. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, Acts ten is very much paralleled, I think, in Galatians three, where Paul says, "Well, look, you received the Spirit, but you did that before you started living in the Jewish mm. way of life, before you started observing the ways uh, of the works of the law." So um, that's why. Uh, Paul can create communities that are diverse and it's in fact only in that diversity that people recognize oh well it's not just people like me then who are who, who are who are included in, in God's grace and therefore it can't be my my uh, upbringing or my education or my social worth or my cultural uh, uh, habits that are the condition for God's for God's grace to operate and what led me to think about Acts 10 is because my son, um, he's 18, he got baptized like three weeks ago. Uh -huh. oh, so, so that forced me to 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 reread the text. Uh, and yes. that's I came to the yes. conclusion. I, I read it with him because I have to explain to him this yes. is the parts where, where you see people baptizing. When I was reading it to him, that came uh -huh. into my mind. Oh, uh -huh. 
they were so amazed that even two Gentiles, I never, never pay attention to that. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. I think this sort of sense of, uh, and I, th I think that's almost a sort of Paul's, Paul must have been Paul's experience too. Like he preached and, and, and he, he was kind of amazed at what God was doing, you know, uh, um, even among the unex most unexpected people then, but then it made him reflect about his own life and realize that, mm. God's grace reached <laughs> him, even yes. though he was persecuting the church. Yes, and it cannot have been, therefore, uh, you know, on the basis of those of those uh, uh, Jewish credentials, you know, which he thought he was fulfilling by persecuting the church. So it makes him reconsider his own his own identity as well. This is very bubbing way of reading the Bible. Very organic, yes, uh, organic um, interpretation, and um, because. Let me tell you, Babing, Babing is speaking up in Latin America, in Spanish-speaking world, because uh, now they can translate him because all the copyrights are off. <laughs> so now, the, so, so so he's coming into. Uh -huh. Just to let you know how far behind we are. So. Right, right, <laughs> yes. right, right. Well, okay. Well, well, my second question is: What inspired you to write about the topic of Paul and the concept of give in in his writing? I mean, you explain a little bit, I guess. Said yes, that. I think I think so. When I was when I was doing my studies as a young theology student, in fact, I was taught by Tom Wright, who was a, became a good friend of mine. Mm. Um, it was just this was in the uh, 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 early eighties or late seventies, early eighties, and it was just at the time when the new perspective on Paul was um, you know, was. Uh, uh, breaking as it were and the wave was breaking it was becoming a big a big phenomenon on the on the on the scholarly mm. world and um i was influenced by that and 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 much i think uh helped by it but i always felt from the start like there's something here that we're not quite getting and although uh for a time you know i i pursued the kind of social questions that the new perspective raised about how were Paul's churches formed? How were they? How do they mix Jew and Gentile? Um, and it became in the 1980s an important uh, period of time to explore the social history of early Christianity. And I fully participated in that. But I always felt from the start there's something we've not quite got theologically here about the significance mm -hmm. of grace. But I couldn't put my finger on what it was. And I couldn't see in what sense I would disagree, although I felt I did disagree with E.P. Sanders at, at an important point. So it was a kind of nagging question for me. And then when I came back to work on Paul again, and then uh, started to think about grace and think about gift, I realized that um, there were ways of um, break, uh, opening up the subject that um, that could really resolve some of the some of the problems that I'd been wrestling with for decades. Time. Decades. <laughs> yeah, decades. That's right. I've been thinking about this for decades. <laughs> yes. And I kept coming back to it one way or another. But it was only when I started working on gifts, I think, and really thought about how gifts work. And I, it was important for me then to really question my own assumptions about gifts. And that's one of the good mm -hmm. things about studying ancient history. It makes you wonder why, you know, you mm -hmm. assume certain things and realize that ancient people didn't necessarily assume the things but then when i read the anthropology of gift and i realized like you know most cultures don't work like western mm. culture uh, and the ways i had grown up i had always assumed that the most perfect gift is a gift given uh without a return and then then i realized well actually in most cultures gifts are given in order to create or to sustain social ties so of course they're yes. expecting they're given in order to 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 develop a friendship, or to or to or to cement a family, or to uh, uh, um, uh, you know make connections between people. That's, that's what gifts are given, and therefore they can't be anonymous, and they can't be one way, and they can't be uh, uh, without strings attached. And then I realized, okay, so my whole way of thinking about gifts has to be has to be challenged here. And um, that's when I started getting excited because I love having to rethink my my basic my own basic assumptions. Yes, uh, th that's a uh, because in Latin America, when when we're told about this is the free gift of God, there's no strings attached. Our culture is no strings attached. I mean, like you said, you uh, we have a saying. I I, heard, I think I heard it in English too. But today for you, tomorrow for me. So that means that uh -huh. I'm helping you. So you to, so whenever you see me. 
you uh-huh. you're expected to come to my aid. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's how most ancient culture, most cultures still work today, and that's how most cultures Asian cultures work. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. And then I realized that it's only a, a peculiarity of modern, of the modern modern Western culture to try and break out of that sense of reciprocity. And then I thought, well, what is what is Paul himself saying on this? And I realized that. Um, quite a lot in Paul's theology does actually um, expect, doesn't, can't demand, but it does expect that what God has given to us um, will be uh, uh, returned in some way or returned by being passed on to others. Um, you know, Paul would say, you're not, you're, you're free from the law, but you're under grace uh, and you have a new Lord and uh, a, a God, God's grace is transformative. It changes. It it it, it expects uh, it, it expects the recipient to change, mm-hmm. and to uh, and that was really important for me to see that um, this gift is not given, as it were, without any expectations of of, of, of change. Um, that it is it is given in order to transform us um, and to uh, reconfigure our lives. And that is the kind of, if you like, the return to God. I mean, whether that's the right language to use, but I, uh, that's why I, I slightly boldly, I said, well, the gift of God is unconditioned. There's no prior condition for God's gift to us in, in Christ, but it's not unconditional. If we mean by that, it expects nothing in return or expects or expects no future change so it was important mm-hmm. for me to be able to to show that actually paul you know if you live by the spirit then walk by the spirit mm-hmm. he has a lot of moral exhortations which are not uh, undermining the notion of gift but are the implications the outworking of what that gift uh, uh, means and it means the creation of new gift relationships as as we pass on the grace of god but John, let me let, let me let me play the devil's advocate here, and I'm not, actually not the devil's, the reformers' advocate. Okay, wouldn't you be, in a sense, bringing back Catholicism <laughs> through, right. through the back door? <laughs> well, I, I I don't think we need um, a worry about that. Um, what I'm saying is, uh, God's because it's not it's not our own. It's, well, when the God's grace transforms us, it's not a question of like now. Now we have to, as it were, work by some synergism, work alongside God, as if we are ind- independent agents, as it were, our agency attached to God's uh, or supplementing God's. It's that God's Spirit, as it were, works mm. within us and energizes us to to operate to to do the good works for which as Ephesians puts it, for which we've been prepared. And uh, as I see it, uh, you know, the grace of God intends to turn unrighteous people into righteous people, the ungodly into the godly. It doesn't leave us as we were. I think Calvin, you know, tried to grapple with this when he talked about the grace of justification and the grace of sanctification Mm. as being intimately linked. Not quite identical, but intimately linked for Calvin. And... um, then I think you know it's important to say that what uh, when Paul talks about judgment by works and so on, this is not like well, it's still uncertain or it's still uh, we're still awaiting a second gift of grace. What what he's talking about is what will be revealed, what will be uh, uh, exposed, as it were. The judgment is um, the extent to which the grace of God has oper- has fully operated and been and been and been taken into our lives and and has re- and has reshaped our lives. So, not in order to win or to earn another grace, as it mm. were, but in order to um, expose, as I say, and reveal and demonstrate the power of God um, operating or or not operating fully mm. in our lives. So we as persons, maybe we have. Um... Uh, separate too much justification and sanctification as because we want to keep them so yeah. much apart. Yeah, I think that's right. I think I think if you understand grace as as always a relation, uh, mm-hmm. God's grace is is not a thing given to us, which is sort of we can then decide what we want to do with it. 
it, it, it it's a relation of God's uh, favor and forgiveness and uh, um, and and uh, and it rebanks us it, because all relationships you know affect us and change us and this new relationship with God cannot leave us as we were because once we're caught up into the into the will and work of God and given the Spirit that 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 will require changes in our in, in in our lives. So I think it's it's unhelpful to think of justification as a kind of merely a legal decision or a legal judgment that's somehow removed from um, uh, the the new relationship in which in in, in which we are involved. It, it is a new a, a new form of relationship which brings peace with god reconciliation with god in other words it draws us into the life of god in christ and that life is a life of grace and therefore when we experience that grace we are impelled and and enabled and and empowered to uh, pass that grace on to others and it will have its uh, purifying and transforming effect in our in our own lives and it will help us create um, new communities and better communities Oh yeah, you will. Um, uh, how does your book challenge or contribute to the existing scholarly understanding of Paul's theology of grace and gift? Well, I think um, what it's done is uh, help us to put grace back on the on the map, as it were, as a, as, a, as a central theme in 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 Paul's theology. It's helped us understand that this is. Uh, multi-dimensional in other words this is about god's the the incongruous gift the gift given without regard to worth uh, affects how paul thinks about social differences ethnic differences gender differences and so on in other words because this gift is unconditioned um it it has the capacity to, <clears throat> has a capacity to uh to found and to enable uh, communities that cross the normal social expectations and the and the challenge uh, you know, ancient notions of of honor as well as modern notions of of of, of difference and hierarchy mm. so um i think what I, i'm hope what i've done is is to give the new perspective on paul which brought many new insights is to give it a kind of deeper theological foundation so mm. it wasn't like just that paul thought that it's bad to be exclusive or, or, or on some philosophical grounds, or it's bad to impose one culture on another on some kind of uh, political grounds. It's that his, his, his policies in founding and developing communities and his preaching of the gospel were all centered in this notion of the unconditioned gift of God in Christ. So I'm hoping I put grace back as it were on the map. Mm. But I've also, also hope that I've, help to explain and understand better uh, the different ways in which this notion of grace has been understood in the history of Paul yeah, Because on chapter three, on chapter three, on yeah. chapter three you, you give us like a, a survey of a, a, yes. a, 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 what it's quite interesting, it struck me, is that you start with Marcion, with a heretic. Yes, yes, that's <laughs> right. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, I wanted to explore those people who had, as it were, really pulled hard, tugged hard on one feature of grace, sort of drawn it out to an extreme. And I started with Marcin because he's a good example of what I call uh, perfecting the, the singularity of grace. Let's say the notion that God, because God is a giver of, of gifts um, in his notion, therefore God can have nothing to do with judgment and God can have nothing to do with um, with with anything of what he thought involved causing harm so that's why martin said well the god of jesus christ is a different god from the god of the old testament and i'm saying that can't be right obviously for in, in reading paul mm. but I'm, I'm trying to understand why martin would go that way uh and uh, and whether it's necessary to understand grace that way and i'm saying what he's doing is developing one dimension of grace um, but he's pulling it in such uh, a way as to finally clash with what Paul himself says. So I think it's um, I, I've used these sort of more 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 extreme examples, as it were, in, in the history of Christian thought, in order to clarify 
that this notion of grace can be used in many different ways. I mean, it's still used by some to say, you know, well, if God is a God of grace, then we can't talk about judgment and we can't talk about um, the wrath of God at all, or we can't talk about. And I'm saying, no, that can't be right, because Paul does talk about those things while also talking about grace. And uh, it's important to understand the grace of God as the as the as the as the grace of of the judge, as it were, who who is seeking to correct wrong and to and to root out evil out of the world because his his grace is the um, is the story of um, of 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 his self giving love into the world, which 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 must exclude anything that 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 damages uh, um, God's loving purposes. But but uh, but I also enjoy on this chapter that where, where you give this survey how you also show not only how the concept of grace has gone through the ages but also even through the life of one person in this case Augustine how in right. his younger days he was yeah. more graceful <laughs> in, in his later <laughs> days he was less grateful can you can you can you just talk just to yeah to so so well Augustine I mean he went through uh, you know some significant changes as he and and there's a certain sense in, you can see the logic in his thinking mm. as he as he as he explores more and more what grace might mean but he ends up with a kind of, as you know, the kind of double predestination that some mm. people predestined into grace and some 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 to wrath, which is, which is very influential in the Reformed tradition, in Catholic tradition, in in in, in the Calvinist tradition. Sorry, um, but I, I I'm saying I I'm saying I think what I'm saying is you can go that way, but you don't have to go that way. And and if the evidence in Paul's letters does not support you, then you have to say, hang on a minute. Why have I developed the logic of grace in this way? It is a has a kind of logic to it, but it's not necessary. It's not you don't have to perfect grace in those terms. Mm. And what seems to me kind of really significant here is that uh, we pile on one kind of perfection after another. We try and sort of e extreme. Uh, find that you know the next extreme that grace to be pure to be really free must must be this must be that and we draw out certain kind of logic which is um not necessary and it sometimes you know ends up contradicting the gospel rather than rather than expanding it and, and this is what happens in latin america again I, I'm, this is from a latin american audience that right even um augustine changes through his lifetime and uh and either and when I say things about Augustine, people say, no, you're lying. He he wasn't like that. I said, yes, well, his earlier self, he, he, he was yeah. more open to, right. and wasn't into double, into this, um, uh, how can I say, pre-double predestina double predestination. Uh, yes. um, so people change. Um, yeah. um, my next question, it's a very broad one, because um, in your in your research, what did you find to be the most significant aspects of Paul's understanding of the gift and its implication for his theology? Because this is big. <laughs> yes, I think for me, I was trying. The most important thing was to try and explore what were the dimensions of this notion of the of the incongruous gift, the gift given without regard to worth. And um, that was a central theme I wanted to explore in, in Galatians. It made sense to me of Paul's Gentile mission and made sense to me of the way he interpreted scripture and the way he interpreted his own life history as well. And in Romans, it made sense to me uh, of, of, of Romans 9 to 11, how he understood the history of Israel and how he understood the future of Israel. Um, all of those things revolving around the sense that God's mercy is not conditioned by, is not limited by, is not restrained by our human worth or our, you know, the fit with us. So this is, a, a, in the ancient terms, a very, very radical notion because mm. gifts are given, you know, people are anxious about giving gifts well and giving gifts to the appropriate people. You don't give a, an important gift or a significant gift to somebody who's not worthy of it in some sense or another. Um, and so it seems to me there's something radical and something hugely creative in 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 expounding a theology that God's gifts, God's grace is given in Christ without regard 
and even in the absence of of worth, it gives us our worth, as it mm -hmm. were, rather than acknowledges a pre-existing worth. Mm -hmm. And that makes a whole heap of difference in the way we regard one another. Actually, um, that we don't look for, you know, who are the fitting people who are deserving of being part of this community or deserving of being part of my friendship group or whatever. That we um, there's a there's a explosive creativity here, which I think explains why Paul's communities were so novel and were so challenging to social norms, really, because um, he is trying to create communities founded on an unconditioned gift. And, and I also like to mention that in your chapters um, six and ten, you also take on um, the possible sources of of this understanding from Paul and, and you go to second temple uh, literature mm. 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 to to understand what, what what he's talking about. Do you think he was so much influenced or it was just uh, the thought of the day uh, within his own Judaism? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to see Paul as a, as a Jewish thinker. You know, you can't understand him unless you understand his scriptural foundations and the uh, world of, uh, of of his of of his thought, which with its presuppositions about God and about uh, Israel and so on. So I think I think I think Paul has to be you know is is only well understood if if understood in that intellectual context. But I'm saying that it's more varied. There are more. There's more variety. Mm -hmm. There's more uh, uh, difference um, among among Jews of the of of of, of this period. So. I use it as a way of making comparisons between mm -hmm. Paul and Second Temple Judaism, but in different texts, like some texts from Qumran, some texts from uh, apocalyptic literature for Ezra. The, um, yes. I compare him with the wisdom of Solomon. I compare him with the Jewish philosopher Philo. Different, uh, different texts from different strands of Second yes. Temple Judaism, and with different configurations of of grace. So I'm trying to not find the key, as it were, of understanding Paul, but to understand him against that background, so that we can do a sort of multi-dimensional comparison. So, so Paul was, and this is a question that this is because um, I hear you, you 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 love Bulman, and <laughs> you like how 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 he, but 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 he believed that Paul was mainly Hellenistic thinking into his writing mm, but yeah. to me this goes against that trend uh, yes i i don't think we need to sort of just separate out well is he hellenistic or is, is he jewish because the judaism you know in which he operated was itself very influenced by mm. by, by hellenism um so i don't think it's helpful to sort of have an either mm. or here and i do spend a bit of time in the first yeah. chapter you know talking about gift giving in the in, in the greek and roman world which i think is you know a very important framework for understanding Paul too, so um, I think um, I, I think I'm 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 building on the sort of post Bultman era, which which we have found many fruitful ways of comparing Paul with his with his fellow Jews. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I'm saying that's a more complex task than just saying Judaism is X and Paul is is Y, as it were. This is this that that that's that, that that's that's not a helpful way of setting up the conversation and to see Paul in dialogue as it were with various strands of Jewish thought then we can see from that like where does he where does he stand out uh, um, and I think he stands out not only in believing that the gift of God is given in Christ but in the rigor and the practical ways in which he demonstrates that the incongruity of that gift you know, mm. creates a real practical difference in the ways he forms communities. So yeah, just to finish up uh, this question, uh, to me, it looks like Paul is, is one of those, it's one of the expressions within Second Temple Judaism. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I think I'm I'm happy to use that term as long as you recognize that Second Temple Judaism is a very diverse yes. thing. Yes, <laughs> diverse. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, Next question, could you elaborate on the historical and cultural context, and this is what you just mentioned, chapter one and two, of yes. the gift giving during post time and how it influenced his theological development? And what you just mentioned, it came to my mind, yes, because he's dealing with Gentiles, so he has to yes. relate to, to the gift so they yes. can understand it. 
Yes, that's right. I think I think it's important that to understand that how how gifts operate in in Paul's in Paul's you know in 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 the in the cultural world in which he inhabits, which is the Greco-Roman world, where everyday uh, relations of gift are happening all the time in terms of people helping one one another out, or, and uh, um, what you do for your neighbour. As you say, you know, one day you expect some sort of help uh, in in return. And so the <laughs> ethos of reciprocity, of of and and of of um, mutual support. So I think um, it's important to see that uh, it's important to understand where Paul is different and where and where he's not, as it were. And I I, I do think he he uh, expects. Um, that gifts uh, create relationships or sustain relationships, and that they involve uh, reciprocal uh, relations, and 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 therefore he's not an advocate of the sort of top-down one-way gift that we sometimes think of, of of charity as being, you know, top-down from the more from the higher to the lower, and 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 one way, uh, and I'm thinking. No, actually, that's not a that's not how people thought about gifts operating in in the ancient world. Um, even if they were top down, even if they were from the superior to the inferior, there was always some kind of re response and some some sort of return, at least of of honor. Um, so that's why I think it it's you know worth asking then, and that's what I explore through the rest of the book. Like, does Paul expect the gift of God? to be received without any further implications, without any further expectations, or does he expect it to draw us into a relationship with God, which is going to change us? And I think that's what I want to, that's what alerted me to explore the kind of relational dimensions of gift and the, and the gift will, will uh, bring us into a new sets of, of, of expectation. Even, even Paul will use the words of, of obligation. Yeah, because it's quite um, out of the question that that you receive a free gift right. and then you become antinomian. <laughs> yes, that's right. So you know, so so when Paul, you know, when Paul says, "Well, you've received uh, uh, you know, grace," and then says, "Does that mean we can carry on sinning?" So that mm. grace can become the beginning of Romans six. He says, "Well, clearly not." And you think, okay, so his logic is not quite the same as our logic that, well, it's a free gift, so therefore I can do what I like. Mm, yes. uh, you think, okay, so the free gift, if we want to use that term, means it's free of prior conditions, but it doesn't mean it's free of any further expectations. Mm. It has, uh, so it's, it has it's, strings it's, attached afterwards. <laughs> yes. <laughs> After it, the it, fact. That, that's the way of putting it, because Romans 6 goes on to talk about, well, you're slaves. You, you're, you're free from from from... Uh, 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 injustice or, or from sin, but you're not free from righteousness, as it were. You're you're now slaves to righteousness, and he uses mm -hmm. that very strong language. And of course, he talks about, you know, the primitive Christian confession is Jesus is Lord. The the gift that you've received brings yes. you into a relationship to Jesus as Lord or Master, and that can't leave you, you know, free to do whatever you want. Um, so I think that's what I want to to bring out that notions of uh, the free gift that lead to antinomianism or, or libertinism or license or, or, or whatever are, are just not reading Paul well. And, and, and that's because we've, um, Paul's uh, um, notions of gift are, uh, ha haven't been perfected or drawn out or uh, um, distorted, I think, in the way mm -hmm. that the, some modern Western notions of gift have been. Well, let, let me move on because we're running out of time. Um, yeah. um, question six: Were were there any particular passages of or texts in Paul's writings that stood out to you as crucial for understanding his theology of gift? And I know that you you done your PhD on Galatians, and yes. like I said, your index is humongous for Romans. <laughs> Maybe can you can you pick one one of each? I mean, uh, one of each book. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the whole of Galatians. I kind of wrestled again and again <laughs> with the with the whole the whole of Galatians, and and, but I think I I um, uh, I think uh, for 
for me, I mean, a passage that really kind of came alive for me in a new way think, uh, in Romans was Romans uh, uh, 9 to 11, when, when I, mm. I, I tried to grapple with it. It's very, very difficult chapters about Paul and Israel, but I, I think I saw a way in which those cha- chapters, sometimes they're regarded as... As, as 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 contradictory as if Paul suddenly changes his mind in chapter eleven, but I think I saw how Paul understands the grace of God, the mercy of God, the unconditioned mercy of God is what constitutes Israel from the start, what allows God's faithfulness to remain to Israel despite unbelief, and what will be um, the the you know, the root, as it were, of God's of God's uh, future uh, salvation of israel so i think to me like if there's one passage that kind of suddenly clicked for me it was it, it was it was romans 9 to 11 which is the last chapter in this in this book and um, it's not accidental it's the last chapter it's sort of kind of the part of the climax of the book oh uh, well uh, that's what i was going to say um like climax of the covenant does also anti right uh thesis. yes yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah romans yeah. 9 to 11 <laughs> Yeah, Romans nine to eleven. That's right. Uh, we'll 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 all have to return to that and give an explanation of it at some point. And and for me, mm-hmm. I, I, I read it. I read it a bit differently from Tom Wright. I have to mm-hmm. say, um, but for me, it's kind of like Paul's motto that keeps a you know that, that really works there. I think through Romans nine to eleven is God will have mercy on whom God will have mercy, and mm. that's that's simultaneously very unsettling because it's not in our hands, as it were. It's in yes. God's hands. But that's yes. also simultaneously comforting because God, you know, has, as Paul puts it, consigned all people to disobedience that he may have mercy. I never thought of that. I never thought of that. It, it, right. it, it was more like, oh, yeah, okay, Laura, you're going to have mercy. Yeah, but that's why he's so, that's why he's so um, unique because he shows yeah. mercy. Yeah. Mercy shows up. It's like at work. Uh, we, our boss sometimes comes and we don't know where he's going to show up. <laughs> yes. I work in a warehouse in a, in a cold storage and sometimes uh-huh. I'm in minus 27 degrees mm-hmm. and then suddenly he, my boss appears. <laughs> where, right. where do you come from? <laughs> um, right. right. Um, and that's how and, and that's how I see it now. I believe what you're saying. Yes. Uh, uh-huh. me, the Lord shows up. Okay, I'm going to have mercy on you. Wh- why? Yeah. <laughs> what what exactly. did I do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. and, and it's that sense like the whole of as it were the universe or the whole of history is sort of oriented to God's mercy but we can't work out how or why it's going to operate which is why Romans 9 to 11 finishes on this kind of note like well who knows the, you know, the mind of God is, mm-hmm. who, 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 who could tell God how to operate but you know the, the light motif right through Romans 9 to 11 is well, God works in surprisingly merciful ways mm-hmm. yeah um- uh, uh, number seven, what are some of the key implications or applications of post theology of key for contemporary because we're Christians <laughs> for contemporary yeah. Christian thought and practice? Yes, well, that's what I'm exploring further, uh, now. I'm, I'm thinking oh, okay. about, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm writing another book, a sort of follow up to Paul. Okay, and, so and, this is a yeah. this is a preview, <laughs> we get yes. the first fruits, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have uh, I have thought a bit about this, though, you know, in terms of, um, you know, so so at, at one level, at the personal level, it's like, you know, we we our culture, particularly our young people, really um, struggling with self worth and with self esteem, and we're on, you know, we criticize each other, and social mm. media really helps to yes. undermine people's sense of worth. And I'm saying the the basis of our worth is not is not what we are. You know, we've achieved or what other people think of us as the base of our worth is, is is the love of God in in Christ so I've been trying to think through the kind of psychological implications of this in terms of how we help people understand that they are loved as it were and, and, and given worth even if they don't feel they have it mm. so that's why the language of worth is important for me it's not just about your what you've achieved your works it's about your ethnicity, your body shape, your your you know, your 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 um, uh, cultural traits, your uh, etc. You know, very contemporary, of, very contemporary yeah, issues that exactly, we face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, that's important for me, but also I'm thinking about how um, grace enters into uh, our uh, communities and how we 
live as communities of generosity, but also communities of mutuality, of, of support, of, of, um, of how we create communities where we look for the gifts in others and give others the dignity of passing on the grace of God in giving to us and to others. So this, these notions of reciprocity and of um, the circulation of, of the gift. Uh, in 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 community, both Christian communities, but also wider in our yeah. in our society. So I'm thinking a bit about the implications of all this for economics as well at the moment. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, uh, I'm, so, I'm, the, you know, uh, so it's okay. You you can keep it. I mean, uh, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll 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 push again when that book comes out. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I'll say this okay. is the continuation of the exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. yeah. The last question then would be. Were there any surprising or un unexpected discoveries you made during your research that challenged your previous assumptions about Paul and his understanding of the gift? Well, yes, I think uh, to pick up a theme we've discussed before, I think when I first started, I assumed, and this was just how I was formed by my culture, that God's gift would be one way, would be unreciprocated, would be best, as it were, if it laid us under no expectations or obligations. I, you know, it would be free of, of uh, I think that's how I started, you know, like kind of, well, surely the grace of God is free in, in every sense. And then as I worked and thought, thought about gifts and as I read letters of Paul again, I thought my old understanding of that just doesn't work. There's something wrong with the way uh, my assumptions have come about. And I think the most fruitful thing for me was just trying to understand why I've come to, why my you know, assumptions had been what they were and trying to therefore to kind of place my own assumptions in a historical frame, in a historical cultural frame. And when you do that, you can then say, well, this is not necessary. This is, this is, this is not a necessary understanding of gift. I've got to be open to understanding mm. or an understanding because I'm understanding a different culture in a different time. and But I think that's very rich because that's one of the benefits, I think, of, of historical work or, or for, for New Testament study, why it's of benefit for theology, because we then, as it were, take the trouble to enter into Paul's mindset, placing it in its historical context, and then we come back to ourselves and say, what can this contribute in in challenging in 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 uh, reframing the tradition that I that, that I currently inhabit? So one of the ways I think biblical studies is really helpful is for theology is in returning to the source in order to say, does my tradition need to be repaired or developed or or explored further in a, in a, in a different way when I, when we understand these texts? in their historical context, Ben. And, and also, uh, one thing I heard you too in, 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 in other interviews, because I, I, I listen like for uh, three or four interviews, them, the things they ask you. Yeah. And also our cultural assumptions. I mean, yes. as you said before, the assumption that a gift means no strings attached. Uh, yes. uh, that's very uh, European, Western way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I grew up in the United States. And my dad, I remember when I had not seen my dad for years. And then I saw my dad come to Australia, as, as I told you previously, when we started yes. recording. And my dad told me, during the airplane flight, he told me, you don't think like us. Um, right. And I had not seen him for six years. You don't right. think, and, and, and he always tells me, don't ever go back to El Salvador because they're going to they're gonna run circles over you because you oh. trust you're too trustful. You become too Americanized. He told me, uh, too, too gringo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. So already you felt the cultural gap open up there. Yeah. Yes, and 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 that really, uh, I said, oh, that no, it's the truth. But 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 that that was one thing that really shaped me. And then the other things that we have Chinese people at the church. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I remember once uh, one um, that she's she's just young. She's twenty six. And she was born here, but she's Chinese, uh, Hong Kongese, her parents. And she told me, Louis, you don't understand one thing about us Chinese. For Chinese, there's no word sin. For us, it's criminal. I'm not a sinner. They believe I'm a criminal. 
Oh. So that changes the whole yeah. the yeah. whole understanding. So yeah. when you're saying sinning and uh, you're a sinner, yes. when you're preaching, when yeah. you're saying we're criminals. So so yeah. it's, it's a different way of understanding, yeah. grasping yeah. a reality yeah. that we're sinners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that's very interesting. I I do think that you know one of the problems of West is that biblical scholarship has sort of grown up, of course, mostly in a Western cultural environment, and therefore you know has brought some of those Western assumptions. And mm. it's this is the 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 value of doing as this way, thinking about global the across cultures and mm. uh, you know global uh, the global church can really help us here, and also you know good historical work. Yeah. And finally, when I was at the at the Anglican Church where I told you about, um, yes, uh, we had a Lebanese lady who came, who wow. came to worship with us, and then she started praying and she said Allah, and I went and I opened my eyes immediately. I said, "What is she talking about?" But so to me, it was a cultural shock, yes. having been raised since I'm a little kid that Allah is yeah. a Muslim yeah. God. But then, yeah. but yeah. this is their language as well. Yeah. This is how they yeah. so 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 all okay. these kind okay. of things. Your your book has really helped me understand, I mean, hone on those, on those right. thoughts, right. and help me to say, hey, I'm I'm not the end of it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I think I think, and I I'm interested in the examples you choose from the diversity of the church that you live in, because I think one of our problems is if we if we inhabit churches of people just like us, we think Christianity is just our, you know within. Our, our cultural frame we need diversity that's i think why paul gained so much from being in churches with gentiles as it were he needed that diversity to realize to make him rethink his own judaism as it were make him rethink the scriptures because he realized that oh some of my assumptions may be not not quite right my old assumption so i think we need the diversity of different people who are who experience the grace of god in in different ways and uh, but nonetheless the real the real grace of god and the spirit of god and then that makes us question some of the boxes in which we we've, we've placed our christian uh, faith well professor can you stay after i i, I stop the video i sure. just like to ask sure. you some one thing well to everybody uh by this book if because uh, i'm gonna put this also i also have an english speaking um um uh, youtube channel so whoever yeah. wants to buy the book please uh, uh click the link um and you can get it and those of us who speak spanish uh compren este libro uh comprar <laughs> comprar is the very buy compren este libro eh, van a ser muy beneficiados you're going to be very benefited from buying this book um and be exposed to the latest uh, of, of the theological trends. Professor Barclay, it's been an honor. It's been a privilege. And I hope to have you again if I um, if I can convince um, uh, Jesus, uh, who's the <laughs> owner of Kerigma, uh, Jesus, <laughs> uh, yeah. if, we, if, we can, if we can get another book of yours um, translated, right. or even this one, the, the one coming after it, um, the right. gift, um, it will be very great to have you again. All right. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.